here to welcome uh, not only a good friend, but uh, also an excellent scholar, D. Ariola, Associate Professor at UC Berkeley. Um, although he's currently on leave and has a very long title, and I'm enormously impressed. It's the W. Glenn Campbell and Rita Ricardo Campbell National Fellow and the Susan Louise Dyer Peace National Fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford. Stanford is also the place where Leo has his PhD from before that then he at Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. Uh, so uh, uh, already there, it's, it's impressive. Um, his work has been on democratization, ethnic politics, political violence, um, working uh, uh, mostly all exclusively on Africa, almost. Um, um, he's been a visiting scholar at the Kellogg Institute, the Fulbright Scholar in, in, at the Addis Ababa University, also a visiting researcher in Dakar, uh, the West African Research Center there. Uh, he's an editorial board member of several prominent journals, um, so if you're nice to him, maybe, no, <laughs> comparative politics, CPS, and AJPS, among others. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here to talk about electoral violence in democratizing countries. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'd like the, the plug you're already making for patron-client relations. <laughs> that's, exactly. that's, that's a segue to sort of where I'm going with this. Um, so thank you for this, and this is very much a, a work in progress, so I'll thank you in advance for any comments or feedback um, that you could provide for moving this project forward. Um, so this project is an extension of my previous work um, where I was looking at the formation of multi-ethnic coalitions um, in African countries, and in that case I was looking at how money plays into the formation of, of coalitions. And, specifically how politicians from one ethnic group might use money to buy endorsements, public endorsements from politicians from other ethnic groups. Um, and that's how a lot of these coalitions are formed in different African countries. Um, but as I was doing my field work, I started realizing that there was a, another story in many of these places, that um, elections in places like Ethiopia and Kenya where I've worked, you often have violence either before or after the election. Um, and I was realizing at that time that the story I was telling about money, you know, couldn't fully explain what was going on here, but was actually part of this bigger picture about the way um, violence manifests itself during elections. And not just in Africa, but in other parts of the world. So that's what, what my focus is here and of this bigger project that I have on electoral violence. Um, so just for the purposes of this paper that I'm going to present, I'm interested in looking at why we see cross-nationally violence in some countries um, during elections and not in others. So that's the, the overarching question. Um, and I'll tell you up front what the explanation is that we're developing here. Our focus is on the political economy of patronage in these kinds of countries where you tend to see violence, right? Um, that whereas you can try to, you know, talk about ethnic cleavages or you might talk about formal institutions, our claim is that in these kinds of countries where you tend to see violence, power for a long time has been regulated through patron-client relations. That your access to resources and your access to power was in fact determined by your participation in patron-client networks, clientelistic networks. Um, and it's when those networks can no longer accommodate elite demands for resources um, that you're going to start seeing violence. And specifically, the, the hypothesis that we're trying to test here is that the corruption that's often associated with patron-client and um, you know the, the use of, of favors and illicit um, resource and illicit use of resources facilitates elite accommodation. So what we expect to see is that in places where the regimes actually allow corruption to flourish in order to accommodate elite demands, you're actually going to see lower lower incidence of violence 
during elections. So that's, that's the claim. But this is not a notice that I sort of have this claim about unconsolidated democracies. This is not a story about corruption in Canada or corruption in you know, or Switzerland, in places where there's no question that democracy has somehow moved towards um, you know, some consolidation. I don't know, maybe that's not true according to Vidim, but, um, but by most other measures we can think of those places as being consolidated. I'm talking about the places that transition towards democracy during what's called the third wave of democratization, right? where the future of democracy is not necessarily certain, and that the rules of the game have not fully been um, entrenched in terms of free and open um, politics and markets. So um, just to, to be clear, let me tell you how we're thinking about or trying to conceptualize electoral violence. Um, we have a very elite-centered story we're going to tell. We're not going to talk about voters. Um, we don't have this notion. Um, we, I'll tell you, we sort of reject this notion that a lot of this violence is spontaneous. Right? There's often what you see in journalistic accounts of, in places like Kenya, or where you know, the elections were controversial, the people were angry. And so they just took up arms to, to challenge the results that they were upset about. No, what we find is that actually a lot of this violence is coordinated and organized well in advance. Right? And that these and you need resources and up to, to actually carry out the, the scale of violence that's often implicated, right? When you're, in the case of Kenya, when you're displacing half a million people and you're killing thousands of people, that's not just random, spontaneous violence. That's because you needed business people who actually gave money to politicians to actually get trucks, buy machetes, and, you know, buy petrol, to actually coordinate and organize that kind of violence. So this is very much an elite-level story that we're going to tell. Um, the kind of violence that we're looking at is um, violence against the person. So you can, in some places you have violence where it's often property damage, where maybe somebody will attack a party office, um, but nobody was injured. In, in our coding, we wouldn't capture that. We're looking at whether or not people were physically injured or killed during the electoral cycle. Um, that seems to be the most egregious violation of democracy, right? The, the actual attacks on citizens. Um, and our claim is that a lot of this violence is used by elites to negotiate with each other. Oh, sorry oh. about that. Yeah, if you turn off the Wi-Fi, they can, then it won't help. I'll just serve power through. Um, so, specifically, what we do is we, we separate pre- and post-electoral violence. We, we start coding um, a year before the, the election, and, a year, and we continue until a year after the election. Um, and, but I'll tell you up front that most of the violence that we code ends up being in the 30 days before and after the election. Um, and we're looking for you know, electoral cycles that have 25 or more people killed or physically injured during the electoral cycle. So we start counting before the election, up to election day, and then we reset the, the count the day after the election. Um, 25, I'll tell you, is um, up front is a rather arbitrary baseline. But we, we, um, because we're interested in scale, and we think that that's, that's a manifestation of the kind of bargaining that we're talking about. Um, it's 25, again, is rather arbitrary, but you'll see in a bit that it actually makes no difference for our results, um, because we have very few or almost no uh, cases where you have you know, just 24 or just 26. So there are very few or no marginal cases. Most of the cases we code as being violent well exceed um, this threshold. So, um, and we do separate pre and post election, election violence. Um, in most of this talk and the results I'm going to present, we're going to focus on the pre electoral violence because the story is once you get violence going before the election, it basically keeps rolling on after the election. Your best predictor for, for post electoral violence is whether you had violence before the election. Um, and just so you can see what violence looks like over time, in this dashed line here, that's the number of elections um, from 1985 to about 2005. And this dotted line gives you the percentage. On average, it's about 
you know, a fifth to a quarter of the elections, depending on any given period. Um, what's interesting, it looks like after 2000, you start getting sort of a decline in violence. Um, we started extending this um, timeline, and we're about at 2009 now, um, and actually it starts sticking back up. Um, and that's partly, I think, a result of one of our findings is that growth is a good inhibitor of violence. So when you get good growth, which in a lot of the places that tend to be susceptible to violence, these were good growth years, then you get the crisis going, right, 2007, um, and then you start seeing some more violence after that. Um, and this is what it looks like across regions. Um, as an Africanist, I actually thought when we started this, that my region would end up doing all the work here, um, and that's not the case. In fact, um, unfortunately, it looks like electoral violence is a much more common phenomenon around the world than we anticipated, especially in parts of Asia. Um, you also see it in, in parts of the Middle East and North Africa, where you have multi-party elections, um, also Latin America and parts of the former Soviet Union. Um, just to be clear, this black bar gives you the, the percentage of elections with pre-electoral violence and the a light gray bar gives you the post-electoral violence. Um, and also, I should have told you this before, we are coding elections that lead to executive selection. So we have both presidential and parliamentary elections. If those parliamentary elections lead to the selection of the executive, um, and we require that you know multiple parties can contest those elections with mass suffrage, um, and that's basically it. That's all we require in order for the election to enter the, the, the data. We have no requirements for you know, minimum threshold of democracy or anything like that. that. Those are the basic rules that we require to enter the sample. Um, in terms of pre-electoral um, patterns, we, we try to, to categorize different kinds of, of violence. So you'll see that almost in 40% of our elections with violence, you have political assassinations of candidates or government officials, whereas the ones where you know, we, we code as not being violent, there's some, but not, not very much. The average number of injuries are almost 300, uh, killings about 80. About 68% of, of these elections have government forces, meaning the military or the police attacking opposition supporters. Um, or in about 50%, we have incumbent supporters, so not, not police and not military, but members of or activists or supporters of the ruling party attacking opposition. But also, the opposition also does some, some violence in lots of these places, which I think in a lot of the conventional narratives yeah. tends to drop out. Okay, so I will turn off my Wi-Fi. Yeah. I should have told you about that. Sorry, it's the scale on the... conventional narratives about electoral violence, it's this part about the opposition that I think often drops out. And I think this is important to the story about the actual elite bargaining that's going on. Because it's not just that the incumbents are the sinners here and the opposition are the saints, right? There are, everybody's involved in the mix. Um, and this is consequential, right? That in these elections, about a quarter of the elections where you get pre-electoral violence going, the opposition ends up withdrawing. Right? That's part of what violence is good for, at least from the incumbent side of it, is that they're trying to restrict who's competing or contesting for power. Um, and it's far less in these cases with no violence. Um, but also voter turnout is a lot lower, significantly lower, about seven percentage points lower in the cases where you have violence. So you're not just limiting um, cont contestation, you're also limiting participation in the electoral process. Now, an interesting puzzle here, which I don't have a good explanation for, maybe Stefan does, but um, this is true for everywhere except Africa. So if I, if I were just to restrict the sample to the African cases, there's almost no difference in turnout between violent and non-violent elections. That could be because the, the numbers are just made up anyway. The voters' registries are so bad. Okay. 
so, so that, that could be part of it. Um, although I feel that there are some cases, there are folks who, who, who make the claim that in some places violence is used actually to generate turnout. So I don't know if that's offsetting what. But, but in, other, in, if, in the rest of the world, this is true. Whether I'm just focusing on Latin America or Asia, this, this pretty much is true. Um, so let's talk about some of the existing explanations that we can derive from the literature to account for these patterns. Well, the first claim is about, often about social cleavages. It so happens that in many of the places where we talk about electoral violence or we see electoral violence, it's, these are multi-ethnic or, or multi-religious societies where political parties or, or politicians are often identified with one group or another. So it's in this competition over power that's often seen as a contest between different groups that may lead to violence. And so this has been a long-standing explanation for why it's hard to establish democracy in multi-ethnic societies. So that's one standard claim. Another claim is about the institutions themselves, that some institutions incentivize winner-take-all kinds of logic. And in those kinds of places, you're going to see a greater incentive to use violence. So, for example, in presidential elections, you should see more violence than you can or you would in parliamentary elections, because in parliamentary elections, often you'll end up with a coalition anyway. But by contrast, in a presidential election, only one person can occupy that post. So that really is truly winner take all. That's a that's standard um, sort of claim about presidential versus parliamentary elections. Or also, if you're focusing on legislative elections, that single member districts might induce more violence than proportional representation. Um, I think actually, um, <coughs> Hannah Fjeld and, um, and Christine Hogland, who I think are at Uppsala, they have a recent paper, I think it's out in JOP, showing that, that they find that, um, that this logic does hold, that the institutions that, are, that create more sort of accommodation, like proportional representation, might lower the incentives or likelihood for violence. Um, and then more recently, we've had folks looking at sort of um, incumbents and the, the incentives for incumbents, like you can think here about like a Robert Mugabe, using violence to make sure that they can hold on regardless. Um, there's a paper um, in BJPS, I think last year, um, by Emily Hafner Burton, Susan Hyde, and Ryan Jablonski, um, showing exactly this. And then there's this um, edited volume. Um, by Dorina Beko, um, where f I think Scott Strauss has a chapter where they <coughs> sort of lots of the, the case studies that give you the same kind of flavor, which is that incumbents basically use the stick to make sure that they can stay in power. So that's, these are sort of, I think, in broad strokes where we are in this literature. The argument that we're trying to develop is that The existing explanations overlook the economic incentives that elites may or may not have to invest in violence. Um, for a long time, this classic literature from Sam Huntington and James Scott and others um, showed that you know, early on in post-colonial societies, you could actually achieve a degree of stability through clientelism, that you could form or fashion stable ruling majorities by incorporating you know, elites from different segments of society um, and giving them a vested interest in sustaining the system as long as they could draw benefits from that system, right? And that even though these systems did not promote democracy or development, they could be very self-sustaining as long as these elites, vested elites, could draw these benefits. Um, now, what's interesting for us is that with the, the transition towards democracy, this underlying logic didn't necessarily change, right? You may have gone from a one-party state in Kenya to a multi-party state, but this underlying logic remained, right? And that, that's part of what we're trying to tap here in, in our explanation. Um, and that patron-client relations are manifest in a day-to-day -day way. They manifest themselves in corruption. The kind of exchanges that politicians and business people can arrange amongst themselves for their mutual benefit, right? Politicians can get 
resources from business people so that they do this, or exemptions from state um, regulations that enable them to maximize their profits. My, my sense of, from my prior work, is that a lot of business people operate on the margin of legality. Right? Very few of them are, are paying their taxes. Many of them are importing through customs without paying customs. Right? And all of this is happening with the knowledge, full knowledge of whoever's in power. But they, they, they permit that. This is the implicit bargain. And this is how both sides benefit from that bargain. Now, the problem is that there are situations in which maybe the incumbent can no longer accommodate or is unwilling to accommodate growing demands from aspirational elites or new elites. This, this might then induce an incumbent, like you can imagine like a Mugabe saying, well, if I can't expand or accommodate more people in our corruption networks, I'm going to have to use the stick in order to exclude them from, from corruption. And the same thing for the opposition. If you can't get access to these corruption networks, um, you have an incentive to use violence to compel the incumbent to let you participate in these networks. So these elections aren't just about who's occupying power, they're about this broader set of economic interests, <coughs> right? And unless you are able to participate in these networks, you're not going to be able to maximize your profits. Um, and so what we really expect is it's not, um, the way we're trying to conceptualize or operationalize, I should say, the, the um, benefits of patron client relations is through corruption. And what we're thinking is that basically in places where governments are able to increase corruption, and that's something else that's implicit in our argument here, is that you can actually do that. You can actually say, you know what, just, just let the corruption flow, and let anybody, if they have the resources to pay the bribe to get whatever they need, then you don't need to use violence. But by contrast, if you're going to limit who gets to participate in corruption, whether it's on, based on their ethnic background or what political party they belong to or what region of the country they're in, then you're, you may have to use violence in order to back that up. And this kind of story is borne out in lots of different parts of the world. Right? You can change the names of the country, you can change the, the names that's often used in the narratives, um, but it's a very similar story um, whether it's in Africa or Asia or even parts of Latin America and the Caribbean, right? Um, so, for instance, in Kenya, the story is that for a long time, elites were able to actively participate in corruption, but at some point, um, the incumbent was unwilling to accommodate uh, new ethnically defined elites, and so those elites often had an incentive to use violence to, you know, secure their access to land and other state resources. Or in the Philippines, it's not about ethnicity, but it's about family dynasties. And that local families who control, basically, control local municipalities, they use violence when they're competing over access to resources. And they fear being blocked out um, if they lose an election. So this is the kind of narrative that we're tapping into and that we're trying to test more systematically. Um, so just to move to the empirical analysis, um, so, again, we've got this sample of presidential parliamentary elections. Um, we code our dependent variable dichotomously if you meet this threshold about the 25 or more people being injured or killed. I'm going to focus on this for, for this presentation. Um, so we use a lot of different um, regime measures. I apologize because we're using polity and I'm at region. I feel like I should apologize. But um, whether we use polity or Freedom House, our results... Um, I'll show you are pretty much um, consistent. Um, and then for corruption, we use this, uh, uh, the International Country Risk Guide. Um, they have a corruption measure which we rely on. We don't use Transparency International because their time series doesn't start till the mid-1990s, and their cross-section is actually pretty limited. Um, so we're, we're going to use ICRG, and we're going to use logistic regression to estimate the dependent variable. Um, and just so you can see what the data look like. So here is the corruption index for Burkina Faso, and um, I've inverted the scale. I hate it when they do this thing where like 
higher means less corruption, so I've inverted it so that higher scores mean more corruption. Um, and so here's Burkina Faso from the 80s to 2005. And what's interesting is that this sort of corruption scale does sort of mimic what we see, or moves in parallel what we see with electoral violence. So initially, that first election that they had was violent, and then subsequent elections were actually relatively peaceful. And this coincides with the fact that the um, former president, Blaise Compare, um, his ruling party became known by this moniker, even though it was the Congress for Democracy and Progress, it became known you know, as the Congress for the Distribution of Jobs. Um, because everybody understood, it doesn't matter whether you're in his party or the opposition, as long as you play by the rules or by the implicit bargain, you can get access to whatever you need. By contrast, here's Madagascar, where almost every election they've had has had some level of violence. Um, and, and this was, is partly associated with the fact that the guys who have, there's been consistent alternation, and every new guy who comes in basically throws out everybody out from the old regime, including the, the business people who had these alliances with the folks who had been in power before. They all get excluded, and he brings in new guys. So there is, you know, repeated exclusion here. And so you have a real incentive to use violence to make sure your guy wins if you want to maintain your benefits under the system. Um, so we have a clear set of, of hypotheses and expectations with our different variables. So we're using the, the polity index here. So we use an interaction, right? Our, our claim is not that corruption everywhere is going to lower violence. Our claim is that corruption in these places where the formal rules do not really bind or hold um, or restrict elites. So it's at the lower end of the polity index that we expect higher corruption to lower the incentives to use violence. So we're looking at the interaction term for this. Um, we have a dummy variable for parliamentary systems, a dummy variable <coughs> for proportional representation, and we expect these institutions to lower the incentives for violence. For decentralization, we use a dummy variable for countries that allow for local elections. Um, that's our effective measure of decentralization. Um, we expect more diverse societies to have a greater likelihood of violence, and we expect the standard expectations for income and growth to lower violence. And so across our models, what we're finding is that, yes, as you would expect, more democratic systems have a lower likelihood of violence, but what we're also finding is that at the lower end of democracy, right, at the places where we, we would, some folks call them hybrid regimes, some call them competitive, what is it, electoral authoritarianism or competitive authoritarianism. In those kinds of places, at higher levels of corruption, you get a lower likelihood of violence. Um, we, we find no effects for the institutional variables except for decentralization. Though I think actually this might play in our favor. In a lot of these places, if you're allowing local elections, it's because you're basically allowing local elites to sort of, you know, fashion their own um, local corruption networks. We find no, no support for any of the different ethnic fractionalization measures. And as you'd expect, we do find consistent support for income and growth, that higher growth lowers um, the likelihood of electoral violence. And just to, to make this a bit more concrete, I'm going to sort of show you here. Here's the predicted probability of electoral violence under a low, <coughs> in a low corruption world, right? Um, and this is for Africa. I set all the variables to sort of the Africa averages. Or, and, you know, as you'd expect, right? So here's the high end. Um, as, in, as if you're increasing in democracy, the likelihood of violence declines, right? That's what you expect to find. That's the intuition that I think we're, we're all born with. Um, but when you move to a high corruption world, you're holding everything else constant. The only thing that changed is the level of corruption. And you can see that at this end of the world, right, where the Kenya, Zimbabwe's, and the Bangladeshes and other countries find themselves, this is what happens, right? The predicted probability drops precipitously, right? And by contrast, actually, at higher ends of, of, of democracy, the, the corruption, higher corruption basically starts increasing the likelihood of violence. And I think this is where you get to like the Indias of the world, right? The Indias of the world have, are supposedly very democratic, but they also tend to be pretty corrupt. Um, now, in terms of some of the other results, again, focusing on Africa, sort of the, the mean 
predict the probability is about 24%. If you increase income by a standard deviation, it drops by more than half. Similarly, if you increase um, growth by one standard deviation, which is almost like doubling the growth rate, um, you drop the predicted probability of violence uh, again. Um, now, and here's where I think this is where, where the rub is, right? If you're like an incumbent and you're saying, I don't want to face violence in this next election that I'm about to have, what can I manipulate in order to lower the likelihood that the opposition or some disgruntled elites are going to organize against me? Well, you could try to increase growth, but that's probably never going to happen, right? Most incumbents really don't control the economy to such an extent that they can really engineer a standard deviation increase in growth. But the one thing you can do is that you can actually sort of increase corruption. That's something you could probably manipulate. Um, now, to wrap up, so just a couple of extensions. So I've been focusing here on corruption, but I think one, a natural extension of our argument is about the about economic changes and reforms. Because one of the transitions that a lot of these countries have been going through is not just this transition in political institutions, but it's also a transition in the type of economic institutions that they have. But countries that supposedly went through this third wave of democratization were also a lot of the same countries that were subjected to structural adjustment. Right? And some of them really did follow structural adjustment, others did not. And so these kinds of economic changes, economic liberalization, is also a threat to the vested interests of economic elites. Right? If they were profiting from the old state system, moving to, a, to open markets is a threat to their interests. Um, so additionally, um, so I've been focusing on sort of this most recent wave of democratization, but if you look at the established democracies that we see today, a lot of their politics were also patronage-based in the 19th century. So for example, if we think about the United States and Britain, you had party machines in, in <laughs> urban America, and you also had um, what they used to call the grand corruption in Britain, and you also had electoral violence in the 19th century. In fact, in Britain, throughout the 19th century, as constitu more constituencies were being contested by, by multiple candidates, you actually saw a rise in electoral violence, in election day riots. Um, now, some, and, but here's the part of the interesting puzzle, and also a decline. Um, now, some folks might claim, well, you saw an increase in violence because of the expansion of the suffrage. That's like the obvious explanation, right? It's that when elections start depending on more votes, maybe you start mobilizing people or people get upset. But actually, it's exactly in this time period when a lot of the patronage systems in Britain are under attack. And there are a lot of reforms going on in Britain at exactly this time period that a lot of these MPs and parties were connected to that is, that is under attack. So I think that's part of the story that I'm trying to figure out in Britain. Um, additionally, I haven't said anything about vote buying, which is another standard strategy or tactic for winning elections in places in Africa and Latin America and Asia. Um, and it's not clear to me yet whether violence and vote buying are complements or substitutes. And on one side, I can imagine that the, the same folks who use resources to buy votes can also use those resources to basically kill people or harm people if they don't want them to vote. Um, but um, So we do sort of see this in the Afrobarometer. We, here's, I'm just showing you the percentage of respondents in these different countries who say they've received gifts for their votes. And um, here's, on the other side, you see the percentage of respondents who fear electoral violence. Um, and you sort of see sort of two clusters, right? You see sort of, you know, at this lower end, people don't, they're not getting much vote buying, and there's not too much fear of violence, although except, you know, already this is now 40%. But then you've got this other cluster here. Um, now, when you drill down into this data, what's interesting is, if you're looking at Kenya over time, the people who are reporting getting vote buying or fear of violence um, changes over time in terms of their ethnic identities. So in some, in some elections, some ethnic groups are saying, oh, everybody's trying to buy my vote. And in subsequent elections, 
they're like, nobody's trying to buy my book. And why that is, I have no idea. So that's part of this puzzle that I think is interesting here. Um, finally, something sort of disconnected to this, but um, what's interesting for me is that there are um, spatial dimensions to violence that I haven't mentioned here. A lot of the violence is actually geographically concentrated, right? It's not that violence in Kenya or anywhere else is uniformly distributed across the country. It actually, there are pockets of concentration. And why they happen in those pockets and not in other places is still, I think, something that's open to, to explanation. Um, but what's particularly interesting for me is um, when you look at post-electoral violence, how long that violence lasts. Now here there is real big variation. Africa is more of an outlier here than other parts of the world. And so this is the number of days in which there was violence um, in the elections that had post-electoral violence, right? So we count 30, 30 days in a month, right? And so you can see that a lot of the African elections, the averages are, are higher than in other parts of the world. I don't know if that's a state capacity issue. You know, it could be just, you won't remember one of the first slides I showed you is that post-electoral violence is almost as common in Asia as it is in Africa. And yet now they're at opposite ends of the scale in terms of duration. So I don't know if it's because of state capacity that in these places they're able to, you know, eliminate that or sort of stomp down on that sort of threat early on. But it won't, keeps rolling on in these African cases. But here's where sort of geography starts kicking in. This is an urban phenomenon or a capital phenomenon. When I separate out whether that violence is taking place in the capital city versus the periphery, which for us is anything outside the capital, you can see that both in non-African and African cases, it's really a, a capital city phenomenon. Um, and so this is where urban geography maybe um, starts kicking in. So I'll stop there, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, for, uh,